thank you, Rebecca. It's really interesting to uh, listen to that case and think back on my own early experiences as a clinician and what I was taught to do as a substance abuse counselor. Um, it really highlights how far we've come. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Deborah Rothschild, the, the last speaker uh, for the morning session. Remind you that after Debbie's talk, all of the presenters from the morning are going to take their seats at this table and uh, you'll all have an opportunity to ask questions either connected directly to one of their talks or um, hopefully throw out some conceptual ideas that all of them can speak to. So Debbie, please come up. Thank you. Hi. So this is the first time you're not having a break between talks. So if you want to just stand up like a little seventh inning stretch, if you need to stretch, do that in your places so we don't lose a lot of time. But people might just want to take a little break so you can stay awake. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to say um, I was just had this thought when Andrew um, said, well, Debbie's written all this stuff, that I didn't bring any handouts today. Um, didn't seem the venue for that. But I... Oftentimes when I do talk in smaller um, settings, I bring a handout which is um, a reading list, which has my own bibliography, and then I actually have two different ones, one for psychoanalytic talks and one for harm reduction talks. So if anybody wants, there's a lot of overlap in that, but they're somewhat different. So if anybody wants either of those, if you're really interested in doing a lot of reading on this, just email me, email's on the bio, and I'm happy to send either or both of them out to you. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about supervision. And to move this computer or me. Um, so when I, when I say supervision, um, I'm talking about anything from a really deep one-on-one -on -one supervision where an individual clinician presents one case on a weekly basis and we really get into the dynamics of that case and the dynamics of the supervisee and the supervision, the supervisor, and we work very deeply on a weekly basis like that through any kind of group or in-service training where a supervisor or a teacher maybe presents some guidelines or clinicians present vignettes or present cases and there's a discussion and everything in between that. Okay, so sort of the gamut of supervision. Um, I think supervision is incredibly important for everyone, not just beginning therapists. Um, to me, supervision is not just about how to, although sometimes that can certainly enter in, but it's much more about helping a clinician recognize what may be going on less consciously beneath the surface in a treatment, which with awareness can be opened up and can change the therapy dramatically. In fact, I find supervision so valuable that after 25 years as a clinician and many as a supervisor and teacher, I'm still in supervision once a week, and it is one of my favorite hours of the week, always. Um, so with that, I want to sort of bring this into the conference. The theme of the conference today is complexity, right? And as you can see from the program, we're moving from the complexity of the individual to the complexity of systems over the course of our day. And supervision falls right in between that. Makes sense. We're right here in the middle of the day. Um, it's a certainly a complex relationship, right? There are at least three people and two dyads involved, plus everything they all bring. So there's the therapist and patient, and then there's the supervisor and supervisee, and then all the internal relationships that each of them brings. And then, of course, there's also a relationship between the supervisor and the patient or patients being presented, although they probably have never met. That virtual relationship, however, can't help but impact the treatment in both directions, right? So what the supervisor offers will certainly impact how the therapist works, but also aspects of the patient are bound to influence the supervision as well. A parallel process is what happens there, and I will talk more about that lately. But right now what I want to say is that frequently a dynamic which is not expressed in words that's taking place between the therapist and the patient 
can be seen then playing out and acted, as Rebecca was talking about, similarly in the supervision. And it may not be recognizable by the, the therapist or the patient, but it can be recognized then in the supervision. And then words can be put to, to it. It can begin to be understood by the therapist and then brought back to the treatment. And that's what I get out of supervision a lot, I have to say. I also want to say something about what I'm talking about here with supervision and what everybody's presenting in this, uh, this morning in this conference. I think sometimes people believe that we psychologists talk in these conferences about things that are not relevant to everyone. I've heard that kind of complaint about us. That when we talk about deeper therapy, the importance of transference and countertransference, that it's only relevant in a certain kind of practice, maybe only in private practice, or at least in a kind of setting where you can see your patients on a regular basis for a full session at a time. Or as people sometimes say with, quote, high functioning patients. That's not true. And I want to be very clear about that. As Harry Stack Sullivan said, we are all more human than otherwise. So what we have to offer is applicable to all settings with all types of people. It's about how we work dynamically under the surface, what we communicate as much as anything else. Right? And relationships. And relationships matter no matter where we are, no matter where we work, no matter with who. And again, that's why I stay in supervision myself. We all have parts of ourselves that we're unaware of at various times. We all enact certain things that do not get spoken, that are not yet conscious enough to put into words. One of the goals of therapy is to make the unspoken speakable. As Donald Stern, as Donald Stern says, to put words to what was previously unformulated and to thereby make it accessible to be looked at and changed. It's the same for supervision. It can bring to light what the supervisee therapist was unaware of, what was dissociated but enacted during a session. And again, that's true regardless of population or setting. So one of the things I actually love to do is to work with people in abstinence settings, in clinics, who think of themselves as case managers rather than therapists, and to turn that case management into therapy. It's not so hard, right? Case managers have a tremendous impact on their clients if only they realize how important that relationship is or can be. How treating someone with respect, genuine concern, curiosity, and collaboration can change their life, regardless of the length of the interaction or the explicit purpose of the meeting or the setting. And then what feels like case management becomes therapy. In a similar vein to applying certain principles, regardless of setting, is the issue of the philosophy and orientation of the supervisor and clinician. For example, I think of myself as a harm reduction therapist and I'm a psychoanalyst. Yet, I feel I can offer valuable supervision to clinicians who work in very structured, rule-bound, abstinence-only settings. And I have a lot to teach cognitive behavioral therapists. And I think we need to do that. We need to cross-pollinate. And I think that's very much what good supervision is about. We need to be flexible, to be open. So let's teach each other what we know. And certainly, I also feel that there are principles made explicit in the harm reduction literature that can be very beneficial to clinicians working in an abstinence-only model. And I think it's very important that we practice what we preach, that we have a low-impact threshold for entry into our services, right? That we meet, we always talk about meeting our client where they're at, Let's meet our supervisees where they're at as well. Um, so what I want to do, though, is explain what I'm talking about by giving you my definition of harm reduction therapy. And this is called from the leading literature on it, um, the Andrew Tatarsky's book, Alan Marlatt's book, Pat Denning and Jeannie Little's book, articles on harm reduction. I've sort of summarized together the main points that are consistently described by all of them to define harm reduction therapy. And again, I want to apologize. This is the only time in my talk that I wish I had PowerPoint. It's the only list you're going to get. But the rest of it is sort of so more process-oriented, it didn't really make sense. So just bear with me as we go through this list. Um, notice also, please, that most of these things which come from the treatment literature, 
substance use treatment, harm reduction literature, are not about the goal of treatment. They're not about whether we're talking about moderation or abstinence or abstinence only. But they're about a therapeutic posture, about a clinical approach. And this is the approach that I try to encourage in my supervisees, regardless of orientation or technique. So harm reduction therapy is a flexible, inclusive, comprehensive model that addresses the depth and complexity of a full human being and does not isolate substance use as a focus. Okay? So comprehensive, inclusive, complex, full human being. It shifts the focus away from drug use itself to the consequences or effects of over or misusing in the context of that person's life. There is a low bar for entering treatment. You don't need to wait for a person to hit bottom or be desperate for help. Harm reduction therapy considers any step that reduces harm to the user or others a positive step. It is an integrated approach based on a biopsychosocial model, integrating techniques and modalities. There is a recognition that each patient and each patient therapist dyad is different and unique. It is collaborative and flexible, both in goal setting and in treatment. And I want to emphasize this for this purpose. In harm reduction therapy, there is an emphasis, and this is always made explicit in the literature, an emphasis on the importance of respect and curiosity in the clinical relationship and that the relationship matters. So I want to begin there. The importance of respect and curiosity. Rebecca talked a lot about curiosity, and I do too. <laughs> I think it's really important. Um, curiosity is key. Supervisees often believe that they should know. I would rather they be curious. One of the things I work on a lot with my supervisees is a tendency that early therapists have to ask questions of their patients that they themselves believe they have an answer to, and they want the patient to come up with it themselves. It's sort of like, um, I'm thinking of something, I have a right answer, and I'm going to make you figure it out, right? <laughs> Which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, and that's not really curiosity, right? If therapy is to discover something that's already obvious, not a whole lot is going to change. So, for example, somebody would say, let's just say, you know, who else in your life got drunk and angry like that? And the patient will think and say, uh, well, my first boyfriend? Yeah, and who else did? <laughs> my mother. Like, yeah, you got it. And now what? Right? So, yes, it might be helpful for the patient to recognize that they're repeating a relationship that originated with their mother or something. But why did you set it up like a test? Again, that's reinforcing the notion that the therapist is the authority is a teacher and is going to teach you something rather than we're engaging in a journey together. So isn't it a different attitude then? And, I, and this is my perspective. I know there are people who do set themselves up as a teacher and, and therapy can teach. But if relationship is key and we're on a journey of exploration together, wouldn't be, it's different, I think. It's just a very different experience for your patient to collaborate, to be collaborative, to be honest, to be curious. So instead, perhaps something like this reminds me to be starting out with honesty. This reminds me so much of what went on with your mother. Did you notice that? I wonder if you ever wondered about it. Right? And if it's no, well, how interesting that you never noticed. What do you make of that? I'm really curious that you never noticed. Are you? Or they did notice, you know? What are your thoughts about it? Are you curious how you ended up in this again? I wonder what it's like for you in those moments. Can we wonder together about how you've ended up repeating something in your life that you found so distressing? So as supervisors, one of the things we can do is teach clinicians to collaborate, to wonder together, as well as to collaborate on making goals and doing the work. And another thing supervision can do is teach therapists that it's okay not to know. In fact, it's better. You don't know. You can't, right? If, it was, if you knew, then therapy wouldn't be necessary. So a lot of what we do in therapy is join in, our, in a relationship with our patient to see what emerges, what unexpected dynamics 
develop between us that then can possibly shed light on how the patient's mind works. And we can then begin to put words on to figure out. So related to not knowing, and very important in this work, is that we don't know what a particular person's experience is with a particular drug. Even if I used that drug and became addicted to it and used it very much like you're doing right now, we are two different people and I don't know your experience. So I want to know from you. Again, curiosity is key. That's the position I hope my supervisees take, regardless of their own personal history or the setting in which they work. And by the way, I'm not saying you have to say that out loud, but that's what will be reflected, I hope, in the kinds of questions that are asked and in how the relationship develops. And also in setting a goal. I don't know where somebody's efforts will lead. I can sometimes get a pretty good sense if somebody, for example, will be able to moderate or not based on their history and what they tell me about their pattern of use, their prior attempts. But really, I'm not a fortune teller. I wish I was, but I'm not. So I'm always willing to explore with my patient and find out. But to do that can be really scary. It helps to have someone to share it with, and a supervisor can be that person. So I've supervised and taught counselors who work in substance use settings, and I supervise clinical psychology students and other clinicians just who are in training to become therapists, having nothing to do with substance use. And then sometimes I also supervise clinicians who come to me specifically because they want to learn how to work with substance use issues. It's been surprising to me how often my students who are not in training to work with substance use, like the PhD clinical psych students, um, end up with patients where substance use is an issue. It happens over and over again. It's amazing, and they just happen to have been assigned to me. So one thing I think we need to be aware of is if that happens so often with me, how often does it go unrecognized and unaddressed in supervision and in therapy in general? Right? And I think this does happen for many reasons. People don't raise it and clinicians don't ask. <laughs> but I've often found that my supervisee tells me that the patient did raise it in session, maybe just in passing though, not as a problem they want to address, but, some, but my, pa my supervisee knows that the patient was drinking or using in a particular way that seems a little dangerous, and they mention it to me during supervision. And sometimes when I ask, did this ever come up before? Maybe it has, but has it been addressed? Not really. One of the things that happens, and one of the reasons I think this happens, is that people believe that to address it, they have to make a big deal, to separate it out from the therapy, right, to isolate the substance use. Like, now we're going to talk about this, and then that will overshadow everything else and disrupt the rest of the therapy. Or, if not that, then it's just not that serious. It's not an addiction, so we don't have to address it, right? And I think this goes back to what Andrew was talking about, the sort of the spectrum and the ability to enter anywhere, right? Um, people have a hard time, clinicians have a hard time knowing how to ask easily about it how to embed it in the larger context of what they're concerned about, to see it and talk about it as one part of a larger whole. But once my supervisee and I can talk about it that way, usually it can, talk to be, it can be talked about like that during sessions, and it can become something that can be watched and monitored and talked about along with everything else they discuss. And they don't need to refer them out, do something else, right? And I think also it's because this harm reduction approach is relatively new and because, sadly, not much about substance use treatment is taught in graduate schools, the idea of intervening early to help somebody who's not out of control but perhaps worried about their use is not on a lot of people's radar. They don't know how to approach it without catastrophizing, without saying, oh, my God, you're really in trouble. You've got to go to AA right now, right? Just to sort of approach it gently, easily, as part of the whole person. Just another thing we're talking about. Um, and this, this approach it may be new to a lot of people. I'd say I'm surprised and pretty dismayed about how little training clinical psychology and other clinical programs offer in substance use treatment. Unless somebody takes an elective, they can graduate and have no idea how to address it. Um, I had a supervisor, a very skilled graduate student, who was in an analytically oriented PhD program. She had worked with the same patient for a couple of years and they had a good relationship, were working well together. And one of the many issues in his life was over drinking, which came up during our supervision, not immediately as an immediate presenting problem, but, you know, a little ways in. And we talked about how to help him moderate his drinking. 
We did some very concrete work around it. I suggested she ask him some very specific questions to come up with a plan of ideal use, and then once that plan was developed, she could make specific question, suggestions, sorry, specific suggestions about how he might attain that goal. I asked her if she had ever done this before, if anyone had ever reviewed this with her. She had been in supervision for years with this patient. Never. It had never been discussed in a previous supervision. She had never been taught how to do that concrete work. Very concrete, very specific goal setting and planning and moderation. So I helped my analytic supervisees become more concretely behavioral without giving up their analytic perspective. And that's important. It's without giving up the analytic perspective. They ask questions about ideal use, dangerous use, past history of using, attempts to moderate, times of overusing, what happened, all of that. Help their patients develop a plan and a goal. What, what would your ideal plan look like? And then I teach the therapist how to help their patient attain their goal. Things like counting drinks. If you're only going to have two drinks a night, do you want them both at the beginning of the night or one at the end of the night? Do you want to save one for dinner and have one before? That kind of thing. Planning it out. If somebody's going to a party and wants to not drink at all or have only one or two, help them prepare. Figure out what they will drink before they go. Ginger ale with lime, seltzer, cranberry juice, right? Role play it. Order it from me like I am the bartender. Now, imagine your friend standing next to you at the bar. Do it again. Now you're at dinner. The waiter comes around with wine. Your boss is sitting next to you. What do you say? Many therapists are not used to doing this kind of specific work, specifically analytic therapists especially, I would say. So in supervision, we role play them, role playing it with their patient. And like this, supervision can help analytic clinicians do more behavioral work. But supervision can also open the eyes of behavioral therapists to the benefits of thinking psychoanalytically. And that's what I want to concentrate on now because I think it's really important. It's so important. It can make such a significant change in a treatment. What psychoanalysts have to offer is the idea of curiosity, openness to surprise, way beyond offering expertise and teaching of skills. And psychoanalysts, especially relational analysts, which is what I am, work within the relationship and the process that takes place within it, not just the content of the sessions. So in addition, relational analysts also work from a particular model that's very applicable to working with addictions that I want to talk about, and that's been referred to a lot today. A number of people have talked about dissociation, but I want to apply it specifically here. And um, it's known as the self-state model. Okay. And that enhances the behavioral work tremendously. I think it gives it a much greater transfer for success. So I'm just going to do this review. We've, we've sort of referred many times to dissociation and dissociated self-states today. I'm going to put it in the context of relational psychoanalysis briefly. So relational psychoanalysts in general believe that relationships are key in development and in life and in treatment, right? And by relationships, we mean both external and internal relationships, meaning like the relationships out there in the real world today, and internal, the images of relationships and people carried in mind, and then also the relationships between the parts of the self. And for the moment, that's what I'm focusing on, and that's what I mean by the self-state model, the parts of the self and the relationship between the parts of the self. So right, we all have different ways of being at different times, and those different ways of being can be referred to as self-states. And under varying circumstances, of course, we embody varying self-states. And different people at different times, or any one person at different times, may be more or less aware that there is a possibility for different self-states to exist. Right? And that less awareness is greater dissociation. Right? So, the, when there's a discontinuity between self-states, when somebody is not aware that there is a possibility for different self-states to exist, right, then there is an inability to hold different views of oneself at the same time, to take perspective on things, to step back and take perspective on a whole. So it's like when you are at one moment, when who you are at one moment is the only who, the only person that you ever have been or ever will be, 
then the tendency is to experience any immediate subjective experience as absolute truth. Right? Make sense? So therefore, there is no conflict. Because there's no possibility to be another way, there's no conflict. One is lost in the moment. Self-reflection, stepping back and looking at oneself, is almost impossible. Now, why is this so important, particularly here? Because the self-state that someone is in, when in the therapy room, may be completely dissociated from a self-state that might emerge later, for example, at night when home and lonely, or with friends at the bar. So, when we're doing that role-playing and all that planning, that person, your patient, may be completely on board with you and enthusiastic about it. But if they, are in it, if they are in a dissociated state where only the part of them that wants to get well is active and involved, they may be completely unprepared for a different self-state to emerge later, a self-state that was not part of making those plans and only takes over later at night with different needs and desires. So they're not aware of feeling conflicted when they're making the plans with you, and they're not aware of feeling conflicted later. Each one feels like absolute truth. And what we want, of course, is to bring our patient to conflict. When I work with patients, what I really want them to do is to make a conscious decision about using. I always say my goal isn't for me to decide whether you should use or not, but for you to make a conscious, fully thought-through decision. So learning about that dynamic can completely change a supervisee's attitude toward a patient and the way the work proceeds. Because not being aware that this can happen often leaves therapists, as well as patients, feeling frustrated, feeling like a failure. And for the therapist, often feeling manipulated or lied to and angry. And I'm going to demonstrate this with the words of one of my supervisees who was kind enough to write up the experience for me. She has a patient who expressed concern about her own intake of alcohol and described incidents in which she binge drank and did things she later regretted. And here, slightly modified, only slightly, is what my supervisee had to say. Quote, As per Dr. Rothschild's suggestion, I have routinely asked T to articulate in great detail her alcohol intake as well as any concomitant thoughts, feelings, or attitudes surrounding her drinking. I noticed that T's answers to these questions often changed weekly. At times, T said she liked drinking because it helped her stop feeling emotions that felt otherwise inescapable. In this self-state, T was unwilling to set specific limits on her drinking within session, preferring instead to see what happens. Yet such lackadaisical planning often resulted in unfortunate binge drinking episodes. In other sessions, T dismissed my inquiries into her drinking habits with irritation, saying, uh, like I said, it makes me feel sick to drink, indicating that, of course, I'm not going to drink too much. And on these days, she had no problem limiting her drinking, and she would choose a limit for herself and try to stick to it. She would plan to stick to it. So from the standpoint of perceiving T as a singular self, I had struggled to understand and felt relatively powerless to explore the striking difference between T's thoughts and attitudes on one day versus those on the next. Without a way to exchange, explain sorry, T's sudden change of heart, I decided that she was intentionally and actively shutting me out of her internal world, perhaps even lying to me. I often found myself throwing my hands up in defeat, wondering if I would ever be able to understand T or be an effective therapist to anyone, for that matter. Dr. Rothschild repeatedly reminded me that both T's desire to binge drink and her repulsion to alcohol are important aspects of who she is. Further, regardless of whether or not T herself can recognize those different aspects, it is my job to hold them in mind. Through these consistent reminders, I have learned to develop evenly hovering attention. I no longer grasp onto facts, in quotes, about T, which, if she disclaims, trigger my own shame reaction and a tendency to attack myself for not better understanding her. Rather, recognizing the dynamic nature of T's self, I have gained a heightened appreciation for the present moment and allowed myself to be with T. Hope has replaced dread 
and my curiosity about tea has flourished. Ultimately, this has left me with a more colorful and perhaps most importantly, more accurate representation of my patient tea. So this notion that a patient is lying is so common in substance use work when patients don't follow through on what they say or will do or when they change what they say from session to session, right? We hear this over and over again that, that particularly people who use substances lie. I find it much more useful to explore that phenomenon than to confront it and label it a lie. There is so much pressure on substance use therapists to get their patients sober. I think that really interferes with doing good therapy. We get so anxious, as Rebecca was saying, we feel like we have to do something. And I'm not suggesting that sobriety is not a goal or sometimes the most important goal of therapy, but what I'm saying is that using a substance is part of a picture of a whole human being. And when there's that much focus on sobriety, the whole can be lost. And related to this is the potential for an enactment that can take place between the therapist and patient, which can defeat the treatment if it's not carefully monitored. And this is another place that supervision can help. An enactment, of course, is something nonverbal that happens in the process of the therapy that both the therapist and patient may be unaware of for a time and have no words to describe. A supervisor, being a little outside the dynamic, may be in a better position to see it. Also, I'm at the moment referring to a very specific enactment, which is something so common in substance use treatment that a substance use supervisor may know to watch for it and point it out. And that enactment that I'm referring to now is when the therapist and patient collude to keep the using part, meaning the self-state that enjoys or benefits from using, out of the room. Like my supervisee's patient, T, Right? Patients may sometimes be in touch with how a substance helps them feel better or not feel at all, and sometimes not. And it can be threatening to a therapist to hear that using has benefits, that the patient gets something for it, from it. It can be very threatening to hear that the patient wants to keep using or is making plans that could lead to use. It feels better when the patient is aware of the risks and is on board with not using at all or using little and safely. So the enactment that can happen is something like a collusion between the part of the patient that wants to get well and the therapist to keep that using part silent, not threatening. So like when a patient says, that's my disease talking, right? We've all heard that. It's a way of dismissing what feels like a dangerous thought, and the therapist agrees and says, yes, that's your disease, ignore it. Right? Really? In therapy, no thought should be ignored. Isn't it better to expose it and explore it in the therapy room than to push it underground, let it pop up later unanticipated with no preparation? So I help my supervisees engage with those parts, invite them into the therapy room, and by doing that, help their patients figure out the benefits of using, help their patients figure out what their quote of the disease, if you want to call it that, is saying. Let's listen to it when it talks in therapy. Right? We need to know what to grieve or what to replace if they do change their pattern of use. But of course, that can be scary for all involved. And to really expose the desire to use can expose us to danger. But it is not going to go away by not talking about it. It can only be healed if it's invited into the therapy and participates in the therapy. So you just heard from Rebecca about countertransference dynamics, and those are, of course, so relevant to supervision and so important in the work. And uh, Rebecca talked about countertransference as feelings that are induced from your patient, which is, of course, true, but I think something that Rebecca didn't mention that needs to be said, particularly as a supervisor, is that it's not only an induced feeling. It is a feeling that comes up in relation to your patient, that also comes from you. So each therapist is going to have a different experience with the same patient, a pa right? So it is the induced feeling mixed with who we are and our own feelings and reactions. And it's really important to know your own ideas and your own feelings and your own stereotypes. We all have some, and of course they affect our work. Am I getting over time? Okay. So 
think differently. I mean, think, think about how do you, differently do you feel? What are your stereotypes and feelings, right? If somebody calls and says, I'm coming in because I have anxiety. I'm coming in because I had a death in my family. I'm coming in because I drink too much at parties. I'm coming in because I've been injecting heroin for eight years. What do you expect, right? How differently are you going to greet that patient, if at all? And what if you are in recovery and you believe a 12-step program saved your life and your patient says, I went to several meetings, it doesn't work for me. Do you accept that and work with them or do you believe they're not ready to work? Do you say one thing but can't help yourself from believing another? Things like that. What if your patient says they don't want to be abstinent and you believe they should be? How open can you be? Um, Talking these things through with a supervisor can help. And talking with a supervisor can help you identify ideas that have not been articulated or not quite conscious. Almost done. And I just want to mention then parallel process quickly. Um, right? What happens in supervision can reflect what's happening in the treatment itself, which can be conscious or unconscious. So I consciously, deliberately model curiosity and openness with my supervisees. I want to know what they're thinking and feeling during a moment in treatment. I wonder why they said what they did, even if I would have done it differently. And I hope that through that process, it will influence their stance with their patients. And then, do I have time to give an example of an enactment? Okay. Um, So parallel process also can enact something that's being enacted in treatment. For example, I have a supervisee who, although she is anxious to learn and be supervised, seemed to reject every suggestion I made. It wouldn't work. She tried it, and it didn't work. She'd tell me why it just won't be helpful for this patient, why she won't even try the suggestions I make, no matter what, I said. I was feeling completely frustrated, mostly not partly with her, but with myself. I felt completely useless, like I was completely failing her as a supervisor. I'm not really sure how aware she was of all that. I don't think very. But in supervision, interestingly, she was describing her patient as frustratingly help-rejecting with her. She talked about how delicate she felt she had to be in probing or making suggestions because he would brush them off. He seemed so annoyed. He'd tell her it's not that easy. It's not going to work. I was feeling frustrated for a few weeks before I realized how parallel what was going on with us was to what she was talking about. And then when I finally realized it, I could tell it to her, and we talked about it. Now, this is very recent, so I don't know yet how or if it will impact her treatment with him, but it has certainly changed the supervision. It has certainly opened that up in a whole new way. And it's interesting to notice. So in summary on supervision, like good therapy, good supervision is a collaborative effort. A supervisor has expertise, but not authority, and does not know everything about the supervisee. Good therapy cannot happen if a therapist is not authentic and true to her or himself. Therefore, if a supervisor recommends doing or saying something that doesn't feel right to the supervisee, it won't work. A good supervisor must get to know the supervisee and be open to who that person is, work with what is true for that unique individual. And likewise in therapy and what I try to impart to my supervisees, you are an expert on many aspects of therapy and substance use. The effects of using, the impact on the body, withdrawal, brain, all of that. And tools for sobriety, resources, tricks for drink counting, knowing how to engage family, all of that. And you're hopefully skilled at exploration, making connections, understanding nonverbal and verbal communications. But you are not an expert on your individual patient. Be open. Be curious. Don't ever assume. And remember, the relationship matters. How you approach your patient, how available you are to relate to all parts, to accept all aspects, to welcome and collaborate, that will make treatment effective, much more than what you have to teach. Anyone can teach. Be you, be your unique self as a therapist, and engage with the unique self of your patient. 